And here we go. And uh, I, am, I am I sharing my screen? It doesn't. Yes, you are. You can okay. see it. Yeah, so you can see it. I wanted to mention that the work with art that we're doing uh, is available. Uh, we've created a little uh, web page on our website uh, that gives you access to all the things we're, we're doing. And we'll give you the link to that so that when we inevitably run out of time, you can continue to explore anything we've done. Uh, so, uh, but this, uh, as I mentioned, in our course, we start out with uh, art and then we progress to music. And, and we do it in that order because what we found the first time we did this, we started with music, but we found uh, for us at least, the graphics of the art is more concrete and therefore it's easier for students uh, who are novices to really, uh, you know, get excited and, and do interesting things and then move on to the more abstract work with music. And so this video, 30 second video clip I'm going to share shows Rachel working with some students who had originally in SNAP programmed a, a drum machine on the computer. And then they created solenoids, which they hand wound uh, that were used to tap on various surfaces to create a, a mechanical drum machine. And so I'm just gonna play the the clip and, and let you see the kind of things that they, they were doing. So, so that was toward the end of the, the summer workshop that, that Rachel did. And they started out with art and then they did music on the screen of the computer. And then eventually they made music machines that were mechanical music machines. Rachel, is there anything, what, what were the reactions of the kids and what do you think you learned this, this summer from doing this? Yeah, I think, um, I think depending on, on the age group, uh, you know, you might have to give more scaffolding for uh, students who are younger versus um, students who are older because some of the, um, we were, they were doing a little bit of making like a drum sequencer, a digital, a digital one or part of it. And, um, uh, but also I know like some, some folks in some of Glenn's classes at the University of Virginia also take part in doing that as one of their assignments too. So it's more about like scaling things so that you know, kids could get this like a very similar experience, but um, maybe not, you know, as intense. <laughs> right, you have to provide a little more scaffolding, scaffolding depending on the age. But I think people of all ages take joy in art and music. And in fact, um, because of Cynthia Solomon, we acquired an embroidery machine, which we love and hate on alternate days, depending on whether it's doing what it's supposed to do. And so one of the very first things we do is have them use, uh, we don't actually, we just have them do the design in, in uh, SNAP and then transfer that design to an embroidered pattern. I, I think this engagement where the, the kids are doing things, they're not just watching the computer make the drum pattern, they're collaborating in this sort of mixed environment. Uh, and 
uh, I think it's the engagement where you're doing stuff that you actually get ownership and appropriate it and, and make it your own. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, three or four of the activities that we use to scaffold this. Uh, and then depending on what your interests are, we can, you can either do some of these activities or we can talk or we can show you a little bit of what we're doing to, with music as well, if anybody's interested in that. So we start out uh, and we, uh, I'm gonna play just a short video uh, of another collaborator who can't, is not here because she, she lives in uh, Hawaii, Alexis Kellum. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, I think five in the morning for her, but we have a video of Alexis and I wanted to, the very first thing we do is we enter, we, we begin with the artist Rothko, who, as you probably know, a, a lot of his art involves bars and colorful patterns. And Alexis had the idea, when they're just starting out, let's have them create a solid bar and stamp the bar on the screen to create a Rothko-like uh, piece of art. Then we go from there to a, a Pollock inspired type of art where you're just splattering paint on a screen. And then we go to impressionist paintings and Seurat and pointillism. And each of these activities scaffolds on the next so that you're doing a different style of art, but you're also learning. learning. For us, uh, our goal is, is engagement. So, all the coding is kind of in the background and they just learn how to do it when it, it becomes uh, necessary. So, um, and then hopefully over time, they, they become more and more proficient and engaged. So this is a little video uh, from Alexis uh, that I'm going. Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use the solid bar command we created in the last section in order to make Rothko inspired art bars and artistic patterns. So first, I'm just going to demo the solid bar command for you. All right, so now we have a solid bar here. And in order to begin making those Rothko-like patterns, we're going to turn our solid bar into a costume. So to do that, I will right click on the bar in the stage area, go down to pin trails, which turns all pin trails and stamps into a new costume for the current spray and I am going to make it a costume. And you see here that it, the blue bar we created comes up under the costumes tab. And I'm going to rename this one blue bar or yeah, blue bar, because in order to make those Rothko like patterns, we're going to create multiple bars with varying size and color. So, I'm going to go ahead and clear my stage. So now this is just that blue bar costume. But now I want to change the inputs that I have for my width and height in my solid bar command and create a new bar. And first I'm also going to change the color. So if you go into the pen category, you can grab set pen color. And I think I will do like a purpley color. You want to make sure um, this is aesthetically pleasing because these will end up being your artistic pattern. Alrighty, so I'm actually going to switch this back to the turtle for now so that I can go ahead and create a, another bar. And I think that I will be making this one a little bit longer and thinner. Alrighty, so now I'm going to repeat the process of turning this pin trail into a costume and renaming it Purple Bar. I'm going to move and now a little I further can into the video. This stamping my bars into a Rothko inspired artistic pattern. Something I else I'm going to do is I'm going to change the size of this bar just a little bit so that it reaches further towards the end of the stage area. So now I'll just start stamping. And like I said, I'm 
and have my bar point in a different direction. Changing the orientations of the bar um, adds a lot of dimension to the piece. Alrighty, so now I think I'm probably finished and I think this looks pretty good. So I can save it as a file on my local desktop. If you right click on the stage area again and then go to pick, it says save a picture of the stage and then it will just come up in your local files. And that's how you can create Rothko inspired artwork. So the, um, the, in the videos that we offer, in the first video, Alexis explains how to make the bar. We also provide a text document that, that lets you see for people that like to read instead of watch videos, how to create these. And we also have a couple of examples of, of student work, just so that if a student is doing an assignment, they get an idea of what other people have done. And uh, finally, we provide the code so that if you want to make a, a solid bar yourself, you, you can do that turn it into a costume and so on, so that uh, if you wanted to explore and make one, uh, that's something that you could do. Now, I think we're kind of at a branch point here. We'd be, we'd be happy to do whatever people in the group would find interesting. So we could stop here, you could take the code, experiment with making your own Rothko inspired piece of artwork, uh, or we could go on uh, to Jason Pollock, and it's kind of up to you what how you'd like to spend the hour that we have. Does anyone have a, a preference? I'd like you to go on. Okay, we will we will go from here. Now, what this does, I, I should mention. Uh, that before we do this, we have an introductory turtle graphics unit. And, and basically the turtle graphics uh, unit introduces them to how the kernel moves so that uh, they draw a design. This one's interesting because this particular shape uh, made use of polar coordinates. This particular design could be challenging to do if you were, if you were uh, uh, to use uh, either turtle turtle geometry or or uh, Cartesian coordinates, but uh, so we have a this introduction to turtle geometry, and then once they make their designs, we use a laser cutter to engrave their design to make uh, an ornament for them. So. So we start out there with the uh, introduction to turtle graphics. And then we do the Rothko that you've just seen. In the case of the Rothko, we turn their design into a coffee mug so that for each piece of art, they're having a tangible piece of art that they take, they take home and have as a permanent memento or keepsake that, that comes out of the art. So what that does is get them in the first two uh, modules somewhat familiar with the, the SNAP environment. Uh, I don't know about other folks, but we find that a novice is intimidated by the, all the palettes in SNAP. You can get lost looking for a specific command. And a lot of times they spend a lot of time looking for the, uh, the right command. And so these first two modules kind of just get them comfortable with the environment. Then we go on to Jason Pollock. And uh, I've seen this example done many, many times, both. And basically what you're doing is you're, um, I'm just gonna bring the code box up here. And 
uh, you you can uh, make some. Uh, let me see. Maybe I need to put the pen down. Is that, is that the issue? No, that's not the issue. Hey, Joe, what's going on? Oh, I need to initialize it, maybe. Let's try it now. There we go. So, so what we're doing is we're just putting random dots all across the screen. And I'm going to take it out of the warp block to let you see. So we just you can vary the color and the size. Uh, so if you want smaller dots, you can set. In this case, uh, let me clear the screen. Uh, OK, there we go. And I'm going to change the plant size from 10 to 5. And then we can get these smaller kind of dots. Uh, or if we want it to go very fast, we can put it in a warp block. And then once we've done that, we can start drawing some lines. And when we're done, uh, we wind up with um, something that looks like, here's a couple of examples. Uh, this one uh, is what one student uh, came up with. So if I clear the screen and then run it, let me take it again. Let me take it out of the warp block, clear the screen. And so you can, I think, get a lot of satisfaction by choosing your color palette and varying the sizes of your dots and lines that, that you create. And uh, what I'd like to do at this point is stop sharing my screen and let Joe Watts show an, another example uh, involving uh, an extension of this idea. So I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you for a moment, Joe. You're muted, Joe. Uh, so uh, can we unmute his microphone? Yeah, uh, let me do that. Uh, oh, there okay. we go. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay. So this is uh, an extension of that. Um, here's, wait, is this? This is not, let me. Somehow that that link is off. Um, well, I can show you what we have here, and, th and then I'll uh, find exactly what what Glenn was looking for. Um, but I'm sure, as most of you you know, the uh, the pin color here can be set manually using that block or by setting the pin hue to a specific color. So this is simply a, a list right here that constrains our color palette. So then instead of just picking a random color, we can tell the pin to pick a random item from our pre-selected color palette And instead of getting every possible color, we will get only those specific colors that we, we had chosen, which is what Glenn was alluding to right there. Uh, if you give me one second, Glenn, I'll, I'll figure out what happened with that other link. Okay, well, we'll come back to you in a second. Okay. Um, so, so, and one, once again, uh, for those of you that wanna play so that, I think you're right. It doesn't. Uh, we we provide, you know, we provide the code. We provide videos that walk kids through this, and then of course we provide the text document that that lets people uh, explore these ideas. And 
the um, the the we also have a document that walks people through uh, the process of creating a customized color palette so that they can kind of relate. A lot of times, what we try to do is keep the art in the foreground and the coding in the background so that they're focusing on artistic uh, elements. And we also try to do a lot of work off the computer where they're actually drawing off the computer and sometimes they'll scan that in or alternatively they'll create a computer on the computer that they'll then print out and then add, add to in a collage or something like that. And so we typically, uh, once they get a pattern that they are satisfied with, we'll print it out in a format suitable for framing. Um, so once, once we've uh, created that design, we then go on and we extend this idea to create a kind of an impressionist painting. And so here you see you have a snapshot that one of our students took on a trip to Europe. And so if um, when you when you click when you click this, you can just let it go through. And the turtle is doing essentially the same thing it was before, moving to random points on the screen, except instead of creating random colors, it makes the dot the same color as the the canvas, the painting on the canvas. And so when you finish that, you wind up with an impressionist painting. And I'm gonna walk you through the process of how that, that works. Uh, so here you see, as you add more and more colors, you'll get kind of a painting like that. So here, uh, I've got, this is, a, I did a conference in Bermuda a few years ago, and I took a snapshot of a window box on the way to the conference site. And uh, essentially, the process of doing this is that you lay down a bunch of dots like that. And every time you add more dots, it starts to look more and more like, uh, it's, it starts to look more and more like a impressionist painting. And gradually, now, in my case, I'm adding a lot. Let me just stop it for a second. Or it doesn't seem to want to respond to the master's voice here. Uh, as you add more and more, as you add more and more dots, it then gradually takes on the form of the painting. And while that's going on, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. And in this case, what we do, we print out there's a little postcard printer that Canon sells. And on the back, it has a place to put a stamp. So these are a couple of girls from our uh, summer workshop. This is Kaya and uh, Aiden, I believe. And you can see they've, they've taken a photo of themselves and then they, they use the pointillism uh, to create dots. And we, we actually gave them, at this time we were doing this over Zoom uh, instead of working with them in person. So we printed out a half a dozen copies and mailed it to their home. In the next Zoom session, I asked them, did they like the photographs? And they said, well, they didn't get to see them because their mom took each of the, each of the photo, each of the impressionist versions of their photo put a stamp on the back and mailed it to their, all their aunts and uncles and relatives. So we had to send a couple more. And, and I think um, my advisor, John Black, once wrote a book. And the title of the book was, You Are Your Most Enchanted Listener. And I think it's about creating things that you personally enjoy that have to do with you that bring this to life. So now I'm going to come back to my... Um, 
to my image here and uh, keep working with it. And eventually, let me share my screen again. There we go. And as we, as we do this over and over again, it will start to look more and more like an impressionist painting. And so we're taking a really a, a relatively simple idea, initially just sending the turtle to random places on the computer screen to create a Jason Pollock-like image. And then by making one slight modification in that process, picking, having the turtle pick up the color underneath it when it makes the dot, we get a Seurat-like uh, impression style of painting. Uh, Joe, have you had any luck finding that file? Uh, yes, it got overwritten. So I'm, I'm recreating it real quickly and I'll have it done before we're, we're headed out today. Before the end of the hour? Yep. Okay. So that, that sequence of the four modules that I've shown you has been very successful uh, in two regards. One, we our goal was to make it equally gender, gender neutral to make it equally uh, interesting to both guys and girls. And so far we've attracted about 60% female and 40% male. And they've stayed with us through the entire semester and have not dropped out. Uh, so we consider that a win. Uh, averaged across all the all times we've done this, currently on the, the summative evaluation, uh, we're getting scores of 4.88 on a score of five, on a scale of five, meaning that they enjoyed it. And so, so I think this is a great way to introduce people to coding. We had been working with a, a lab school that the university collaborated with a local school system on. And a lot of that work involves things like using our Dan Buenos to create robots and things like that. And it is true that some children do enjoy uh, programming robots, but there are also other kids that are not as engaged by that. And so I think this is really somewhat related to the keynote yesterday. We want to make uh, the types of activities kids can do more diverse. So now uh, with some trepidation, I'm going to show you uh, something that we have not yet taught, but that we're playing around with as another module in the sequence. But let me stop for a moment and see if there's any, any uh, questions or comments or contributions anyone wants to make. Maybe it's too early on a Saturday morning for people on the West Coast. <laughs> and, and so um, we're now um, working on another module that's gonna, whoops, that's not the right one. Hang on just a second, I'll have to. You might have to just refresh the page. Oh, you think? Okay. If you're on the make the learn side. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, all right. No, nope. still the same. I'll just get it out of my Dropbox folder or I'll just log in. Okay. Um, uh, and so we're working on a We're working on a, a module that sort of turns the corner and goes from art to music. Now, some of you will remember um, a movie called Fantasia that was uh, created by Disney. And I'm gonna play you just a short clip from that movie.
so uh, this uh, this particular movie won a special art Oscar in 1940 uh, for creating new ways of visualizing music um, uh, with uh, an art. Uh, Stokowski was the conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, collaborated on this with the artist Salvador Dali to create these abstract art combined with music. And so we began wondering, well, how, how could we have the kids explore these types of things? And as I said, we have not yet taught this, uh, so we're not giving any warranty. But the idea would be that we would have some shapes that would kind of spin, a, they could drift across the screen like this. And then they could spin while they're, they're moving and we could do some color shifts and pulse them. Actually, let me do the setup. And if we combine all this, then we can do something that may uh, turn out like uh, this. So these are all relatively simple ideas. May, may I interject real quickly, Glenn? Yeah. Uh, I would suggest to everybody also try that one offline after the conference, just because by, by virtue of the fact that we're doing it in Zoom, uh, the sound and the graphics don't sync up as well. Um, was, that, was that a problem when you were listening to it, Joe? Yes, it was. On, on my end, it wasn't syncing up particularly well. Um, the, with the clip I played just now? Correct. Was it for you, Cynthia? You're muted. Mm. It wasn't syncing for you either, Cynthia. Oh, I'm, I'm, it was good for me. Oh, okay. Maybe it was just me. Uh, I, well, I, I liked this a lot, but I wanted to, you know, I want to see the code. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a look at the code. And uh, again, the code is pretty uh, simple. So here, now I have to give credit uh, to uh, Jens for this, because I wanted them to float across the screen and spin. But of course, when the turtle spins, its heading changes. And so Jens said, well, why don't you just use the glide command? So I'm picking a random spot somewhere from the left of the stage to the right of the stage and somewhere between the top and bottom. And then I'm gliding from wherever I am to that spot. So the, the drifting or floating across the screen is really pretty straightforward. Uh, the spinning, as you would guess, is also pretty straightforward. I'm just turning three degrees over and over and that causes it to spin. Uh, and then um, we have a, we have a thing that is pulsing the sound and, and pulsing the shape. And the pulsing is just increasing the size and then decreasing it. So yes, it causes- that's, that's really lovely. The increasing know, and decreasing of the shape is really lovely. And then uh, we then play a sound, you know, every time we pulse it. So uh, there's some other things, uh, we're fading the color uh, from one, in this case, from red. So, so if I if I just hold, uh, actually, let me back up. I've, to to really help adjust the color, we've just created a, some variables for red, green, and blue. And if I turn those colors on, like this, now now what I can do is if I just repeatedly adjust the color, I can use the color sliders to, to change, hopefully change. No, that doesn't seem to be changing my color. There we go. Uh, hopefully, do I? 
yeah, that should be in a forever block. So, so anyway, you can you can change the color. He said, hopefully, uh, that is not doing its forever thing properly. I'm just going to drag this out and just let it run forever like this. And so then, as you as you go, adjust the color values, you can you can change the uh, the various colors of the shapes and figure out the shapes you like best. Uh, I'll put that back in. Um, so once you have colors that you like, then in, in this case, fading from red to yellow, you just start out and you hold the red color constant at the maximum value and the blue color constant. And then you're changing the green from the minimum of one to 255. And so if you do that, then uh, what will happen uh, when I do this fade, it'll start out at red, and then over time, it'll gradually fade into yellow. So we're just varying shape, direction, movement, color, and then we're adding in sound uh, to, to complement it. So, so that actually, maybe this will go a little bit faster if I... Oh, no, 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 I didn't want to start everything. Maybe if I put this in a warp block or something, it would, for the purposes of demonstrating, I'd like it to go a little bit faster. Uh, so here we go. No, it's not going as fast as I would like. But anyway, all of these things kind of come together. As I say, we haven't taught this particular module yet. So we're just showing you an outline of where we're thinking. It's something we think might build on the other modules and be engaging the, the, the students. But because it now starts to bring in the music, we're really intending it to become a scaffold into the work we're gonna do with music. And I, I wanna play a short video clip that, um, I wanna play a short video clip that uh, Rachel did for me. And it's going to explain kind of how, oh, before I go, uh, I want to just show, these are some of the examples of the things students have done, taken snapshots that they've taken and, and turned them into impressionist paintings. Uh, we're just always amazed by the creativity of the students. But uh, this is a... Um, a short video clip that Rachel did to kind of explain how we're approaching the music. One thing we're experimenting with in TuneScope with the music modules is being able to play um, separate tracks um, and have different instruments for each track. I have, um, I transcribed um, the Mozart piano sonata in C major. And so this, in this way, it acts as like having a right hand play and a left hand play together. You'll see here in a moment how that sounds, and you'll start to see too how the way we have it set up is that it looks kind of like a um, like a DAW. So um, a DAW is a digital audio workstation, and so um, usually that's just kind of some music software that people can use to kind of line up different things they want to play together. So we're kind of creating um, a sort of pseudo DAW uh, style way of being able to create your own music. So one of the, the um, one of the the headaches that we've run into as we've tried to do this is we've created the music using the web audio interface or web API, and we're sending a call from Snap uh, over the internet to play the note, and it turns out that because of latencies and routers and so on, synchronization is a huge headache. But we, as you can see, we finally, I think, got a good, uh, a, a good uh, proof of concept that we can be, do the synchronization. And so in the art, we're taking lists of uh, different colors 
and doing random things with them to create art. So in the music, we're taking less of, of notes and doing things with them to create music. Uh, and so, so all of the artwork is designed to provide the scaffolding to, with the abstractions. They'll need to successfully do explorations in music. And uh, I have to say, almost everybody likes art and music and they love to create their own compositions. And so that's, that's uh, what our goal is in, in, in this work that we've been doing.